All right, let's start. So hi everyone, I am Nusret Tash and I will be presenting Interchain Timestamping for Mesh Security. Uh, this is joint work with my advisor, David Che and my colleagues, uh, Run Chao, Fisher and Camilla. Proof of stake blockchains have gained prominence uh, across the blockchain ecosystem and their security is characterized by this notion of accountable safety. Accountable says this states that if there is a safety violation, a third of the adversarial a third of the validators must be adversarial, and these validators can be provably identified as protocol violators. Now, to understand the mechanism of how this is possible, let's consider a proposed and vote style proof of stake blockchain, in this example, Juno, where clients finalize a block upon observing a quorum of signatures by two thirds of the validators on the blocks. Now, if clients finalize two conflicting chains of blocks, like this one, now by inspecting the signatures on these blocks, they can identify the validators that have double signed two blocks at the same height, which is a protocol violation. Thus, these validators must be adversarial and they would be identified using these double signatures. Now, what is the goal behind accountable safety that is used to characterize security of these chains? The goal is to provide an economic notion of security for proof of stake blockchains. Indeed, in the event of a safety violation, once we identify the adversarial validators that have violated the protocol rules, we can slash their stake or otherwise impose other financial punishments on them. For instance, in this example, where a third of the validators must be adversarial and will be identified, the economic security of the proof of stake chain, namely the cost to attack safety by the adversary will be equal to a third of the total stake on that chain. So luckily no proof of stake blockchain is an island and they instead live in an ecosystem of other proof of stake chains. So one such prominent ecosystem is Cosmos where, which consists of application specific blockchains. So this uh, architecture prompts the question whether these POS chains can um, borrow security from other existing proof of stake chains. Now, this idea has led to the concept of mesh security. In mesh security, there are two roles that can be assumed by any proof of stake blockchain. So a, a chain can either be a provider chain that provides economic security. So these arrows show the flow of economic security or a chain can be a consumer chain, which like borrows or enhances its own economic security with the help of the provider chain. Now, the mesh security states that uh, we don't need to have hierarchies like this, but instead every chain can be both a provider and a consumer chain. Now, how do we implement mesh security? So one way that was proposed to implement mesh security was cross-staking. Um, in cross-staking, the validator sets of each proof of stake blockchain not only validate their own chain, but they instead also validate the chains of the, cons the, the consumer chains. So in this example, the, uh, the EVMOS chain is the provider chain and its validator set is validating both the EVMOS chain and also the consumer chains. Now in the mesh security architecture where each chain can both be a provider and a consumer, uh, we will basically have every validator set validating every other chain in this architecture. Now this introduces a huge overhead because the provider chain validators must run a full node of the consumer chains when they are validating the chains. Um, as a result, in a mesh security architecture where each validator will be validating other chains, they will have to run full nodes of them as well. And then this will basically bring up the overhead of validating chains considerably. Now, this brings up the question whether blockchains can instead borrow security from other chains through existing bridging protocols rather than using validator sets explicitly. Now, one such example of an existing uh, bridging protocol that is based on light, light clients is uh, the inter-blockchain inter communication protocol or the IBC. Now, let's go back to the diagram we have seen earlier. So in this diagram, these proof of stake chains exchange messages using the IBC connections amongst themselves. Okay, let's understand how IBC works to further utilize it for our purposes. So let's consider two blockchains here, the Osmosis and Juno. And Juno send, wants to send the IBC message to Osmosis. Now, for this purpose, Juno basically posts a header of a finalized block on the Juno chain and a quorum of signatures that attest to this finalization on Osmosis. Now, Osmosis accepts a message sent by Juno if the message is recorded in a finalized Juno block, 
here, for instance. And then uh, if the header of this block and the finalizing quorum of signatures are posted to Osmosis. And furthermore, uh, Juno would be sending periodic uh, IBC messages to Osmosis as heartbeats in this protocol. Now, you might observe that this protocol naturally implements timestamping. And we will be further utilizing this timestamping to achieve mesh security in our protocol. OK, how do we do this? Uh, let's consider a consumer chain that wants to borrow economic security from a provider chain. So the consumer chain key posts periodic timestamps on the provider chain by means of IBC. Now, we stipulate the clients of the consumer chain to finalize a consumer chain block, not immediately after observing a quorum of signatures on it, but instead we ask them to also observe a timestamp of the consumer chain on a finalized provider chain block, like in this example. Now, why does this uh, boost the security of the consumer chain, the economic security? Now, to understand this, let's consider a safety violation on the consumer chain. Now, this is not immediately a safety violation because, um, because the, the, the lower consumer chain, the lower part of the fork, the consumer chain here, has not been posted on the provider chain yet. Now, for this to be a safety violation, it should be posted on the provider chain. Then the clients will finalize it. However, if it is posted on the same chain as the earlier timestamp, by using the ordering of these timestamps, clients can resolve the safety violation. Uh, as a result, this cannot be posted on the same chain, but it, instead it must be posted on a conflicting chain on the provider side, right? But in this example, even though we have a safety violation, there are two safety violations going on in, on both the provider chain and the consumer chain. As a result, the validators must become slashable on both sides, and then the consumer chain's economic security inherits the economic security of the provider chain. Note that this protocol does not require any change to the validator code since the IBC timestamps are readily implemented by the Cosmos ecosystem. We just need to change the finality rule of the clients to help them uh, derive security in this manner. Furthermore, this idea can be used to derive security not only from a single provider chain, but multiple provider chains, as shown in this example. For instance, here, the um, the, the clients not only wait until the timestamp of the consumer chain is posted on the first provider chain, but they also wait until the timestamp of the first provider chain is posted on the second provider chain. As a result, the consumer chain uh, gets borrows economic security both from the first provider chain and the second provider chain. Now, this is a very powerful observation in the sense that clients can now choose their desired level of security. Imagine an ecosystem where the chains just send IBC timestamps to each other. Now, as a client, you can determine how many of the chains you want to use in order to uh, boost your economic security as provider chains. Now, before we can uh, state the security properties, we also need to guard against two types of attacks in our protocol. Uh, they are the data availability attacks and uh, forks. Um, now, let's consider a data availability attack where the adversary prepares a private fork with hidden block data yet sends its timestamp to the provider chain by controlling a supermajority of the validators. Now, at the second step, the adversary grows a canonical chain. Again, these are blocks are finalized, but their data is available. And the adversary also posts its timestamp to the provider chain. Now, at this moment, if you're a client observing the system, you have two options. You can either ignore the first time uh, timestamp and then go to the second timestamp and output this uh, canonical chain. The second one is finalized or you might wait until the data that is behind the first timestamp is revealed. Now, if you do the first option, now you, you might risk conflicting with late coming clients who might see the data on the lower fork once the adversary reveals that uh, these blocks. Now, to avoid these conflicts, which are dangerous because now we will have a safety violation, and then we even though there is no safety violation on the provider chain, thus the consumer chain won't be getting economic security from the provider side, to avoid these kinds of attacks, we require that a client who sees a timestamp with a quorum of signatures yet does not see the block data must take an emergency break, meaning it should stall. It should stop following the POS chain until the data behind the timestamp is revealed. Now, once this data is revealed, the clients might still see a fork in this manner. And as I said before, they must resolve this fork to avoid a safety violation. For this purpose, they might, use, they might choose to use the ordering of the timestamps on the provider chain 
and then use a cleanup process to basically eliminate later transactions that conflict with earlier ones. In our example, the prime transactions are conflicting with the non-prime ones, so they will be cleaned up once the ordering is made using the timestamps. Okay, so this is basically our protocol in a nutshell. Let's state the security properties of uh, interchain timestamping. The consumer chain can obtain additional economic security that is equal to the sum of the economic securities of the provider chains. So in other words, the consumer chain is guaranteed safety if and only if any, any or at least one of the provider and consumer chains is guaranteed safety. So note that the safety property of the interchain protocol depends only on the safety properties of the provider and the consumer chains. Um, it doesn't depend on their liveness, and this is necessary to ensure that the, the interchain timestamping gets additional economic security from the providers. On the flip side, the liveness of the consumer chain is guaranteed uh, if, if and only if all provider and consumer chains are guaranteed liveness. Again, the liveness property only depends on the liveness of the constituent chains. And finally, in terms of optimality, interchain timestamping achieves the maximum economic security among all interchain protocols. Here, the interchain protocol means protocols which can only read and write to the other chains, but, in, but they cannot use the validator sets of the other chains explicitly. And uh, we also state that that is important. Uh, no interchain protocol provides better aliveness guarantees without reducing economic security. So we need to take this bullet of having like uh, liveness if and only if all provider and consumer chains are guaranteed liveness. Now, this point uh, becomes less important if the consumer chain already has the worst liveness guarantees amongst its providers because it won't be degrading its liveness through this process. Okay, um, finally, we have um, evaluated the feasibility of our scheme in the Cosmos ecosystem and done some measurements. So here we see uh, a table of economic security of interchain timestamping. So each colorful dot is a Cosmos blockchain. So the links are IBC links. Okay, so the thickness of the link states the frequency of the IBC messages and the transparency of the link states whether this link is used as part of the interchain timestamping protocol. So your K states the number of provider chains. Um, K, K equals one means that each consumer chain, basically each dot chooses one of the chains it's connected with the IBC link as a provider chain, arguably the, the one with the largest economic security. K equals two means that it chooses like two of them like, yeah, upstream and K equals three means it chooses three of them upstream. And we immediately see that at K equals two, the economic security of the Cosmos blockchains increased considerably using interchain timestamping. Um, here, the, the, the diagram is in the log scale. Now, you might ask, okay, but are you degrading liveness or latency? So what, what is the cost to the, all of those? So the cost is not large in the sense that per provider chain added for extra security, we only in increase the, 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 final, the time to finality, the latency by six seconds. And uh, this comes at a cost of timestamping of $53,000 dollars per year, uh, then this, this is for the gas cost of IBC messages. Now, if you want to reduce this cost, we can also uh, increase the latency to 60 seconds and reduce, decrease the frequency of IBC messages, and as a result, also uh, decrease the cost of the uh, timestamping. Okay, um, for the details, uh, please check out our paper. It's on archive. Um, in our paper, we also uh, characterize the safe the liveness trade-off in a more general manner for interchain protocols uh, in case that analysis is interesting. Yeah, thank you very much.